This is the Chris Berry Show. Expert information on wealth, estate, and tax planning for the second half of life. Information that you can understand. Here's your host, Chris Berry. Welcome to the show. Very excited this week. Uh, we have Lynn Brewer from Mind University on the show. Uh, that's going to be our second and third segments of the Chris Berry Show this week. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there as well. Uh, and today what we're going to do, uh, start off with our positive focus. So something positive that happened last week. Uh, and then in our second and third segments, uh, we're going to have Lynn Brewer from Mind University sharing some really interesting information about trying to keep your brain and your mind sharp as you begin to age. And on the show, a lot of times we talk about things like uh, aging and, and dementia and Alzheimer's. But today, Lynn's going to talk to us about just kind of the normal aging process, how that affects the brain, and going to give us some some ways that we can kind of fight back against that deterioration. So I think it's going to be super interesting to have her on the show today to share that with all the listeners of the show. And if you have been a, a listener, then you know that we always like to start off the show with something positive, some type of positive focus uh, that happened the previous week. And for me, uh, I've been doing a little bit of traveling uh, for work, uh, big believer in education. Uh, I always have to be sharpening that saw to make sure that we can take care of our clients uh, the best that we can. And so this previous week, I just got back from Dallas, Texas, and I spent uh, two days uh, with about 400 other uh, attorneys and advisors and CPAs across the nation uh, working with uh, Ed Slot. So Ed Slot is really one of the, the national experts as it comes to or relates to uh, retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, and all the tax implications that go along with these different types of accounts. A lot of times for most people, uh, IRA or 401k can be one of their largest assets. And they're very complicated and can be very tricky as it relates to some of the tax planning around those retirement accounts. Uh, so uh, every uh, year, twice a year, uh, I take time out of the office to uh, work with uh, Ed Slot and his group and, and other advisors and attorneys, getting updates on the latest tax cases, uh, as well as just talking about different strategies uh, available as it relates to managing those uh, retirement accounts, 401ks, IRAs. And we've, we've talked quite a bit about tax planning and how uh, right now we're in this unique position that taxes are on sale, uh, where due to the 2018 tax code changes, uh, marginal tax rates are, are going to be lower until about 2025. So there's some unique opportunities as it relates to tax planning. And so today, uh, in our first segment, what I thought I would do is just share just one of the concepts or, or one of the things that we talked about uh, at the uh, uh, program. Uh, and as a member of uh, Ed Slot's Elite IRA Advisor Group, uh, th- this was one of the things that we talked about. And so we talked about the idea of when to do a rollover. So let's say you have a 401k or 403b. Those are what's called qualified accounts, uh, meaning there's a tax qualification to them. And uh, they are also pre-tax or tax-deferred, meaning you haven't paid any income tax on those accounts yet. When you take the money out of there, it's going to be taxed at ordinary income rates, so whatever your marginal tax rate is. And so when someone uh, either retires or maybe changes jobs, uh, typically uh, the individual does not want to leave that account uh, at the former employer. And so they might look to do a rollover. Uh, And there's some things to consider when taking into account whether to do a a rollover or not. And there's actually more than just the option of leaving it at the employer or doing a rollover. There's actually six options as it relates to deciding whether to do a rollover or not or, or whether to leave your money at your current employer. And so the first option would be to do what's called an IRA rollover. So uh, let's say uh, employment has ended either due to changing jobs or retirement. Uh, The first option you could do is you could roll that 401k out of that employer uh, and roll it over into an IRA, uh, individual retirement account. 
Uh, and there's pros and cons of this, and that might be a topic for a whole nother show of the pros and cons of doing an IRA rollover, uh, but it is one of the options. So instead of leaving it at the employer, you can now roll it over and uh, have it in an IRA. And the nice thing about this is that there's no, it's not a taxable event, so it's not like you have to pay all the income tax on that rollover. All you're doing is you're pulling it out of that 401k or 403b or 457 or thrift savings plan, and now it's in an IRA. Uh, Two of the biggest advantages of doing this would be the freedom that an IRA allows you, where in terms of investments, you can basically invest in, in almost anything you want inside of an IRA versus a lot of the 401ks, where all of the 401ks, they put limitations on what you can invest in. So they might have certain funds that you can invest in, and maybe only target funds, or, or you're stuck working with a, a fidelity of the world versus maybe you want to look at Vanguard or TD Ameritrade as a custodian or something like that. But the, the big advantage of uh, doing that rollover IRA is that you have the freedom to invest in whatever stock, bond, mutual fund, uh, et cetera, that you want to. You can even, uh, depending on if you set up a self-directed IRA, you could even invest in real estate if you wanted to. So with that uh, rollover IRA, you now have the freedom to invest in whatever you would like. And then another big advantage of doing the IRA rollover is that it allows you to stretch out that IRA for the next generation, uh, especially utilizing trusts. Uh, Because if you leave the money at that 401k or that 403b, uh, then you have to follow the rules of that plan administrator. And sometimes they will not allow for what's called a stretch IRA, uh, where you can stretch out the taxes for the next generation. They might limit uh, or or say that all that taxes have to be paid within five years uh, once once the owner passes away, uh, versus if it's an uh, in an IRA, you can do what's called a stretch IRA. And a lot of times we name a trust as a beneficiary of that IRA to uh, ensure that we can stretch out those uh, required minimum distributions or those taxes for the next generation. So uh, those are two reasons why a lot of times an IRA rollover does make sense. But there's a lot of a lot of other reasons why you might consider a rollover, and there's some reasons why you might not consider a rollover as well. But that might be another another show entirely. Uh, second option. So that's the first option. The first option uh, at the time of termination or, or after is you can look at an IRA rollover. Uh, the second option is you can leave it in the company plan. Uh, so uh, let's say that uh, you're retired now and you had a 401k at the employer. Uh, one option is you could just leave it there. Maybe you're happy with the investment choices, uh, but what would be the advantage of leaving it at the uh, employer? Uh, well, one reason would be that if you're continuing to work at that employer, actually, so this is a, after uh, 59 and a half, if you continue to work at that employer, you wouldn't have to start taking out any required minimum distributions if you continue working there past 70 and a half. Uh, so uh, most people understand that when they turn 70 and a half, they have to start taking out required minimum distributions uh, of their tax deferred accounts. Well, that's true, but if you're still working at the employer and it's that uh, employer's plan, uh, you would not have to take out any required minimum distributions as long as you continue to work where at that employer where you have that employee plan. So that might be one reason why you, you want to uh, keep the money at the 401k is if you do plan on continuing to work at that employer. Uh, another reason why is that the 401k or the employer-sponsored plan is covered by uh, ERISA. And what that means is that there's a little bit more asset protection from the federal level uh, versus an IRA where it receives some level of asset protection based on state rules. Uh, So, uh, for example, if you were to go bankrupt, up to a million dollars worth of your uh, ERISA or 401k money would be protected. That's at the federal level. Uh, each state is then free to kind of create their own rules around the IRAs. So uh, the same would hold true with regards to IRAs in Michigan. So there really isn't much of an advantage uh, there. But just understand that you're looking at if it's uh, held at the employer like a 401k, you have asset protection through ERISA, through the federal rules, uh, versus if it's at inside of an IRA, you're looking at the state level uh, of asset protection, um, which in Michigan really ends up being not much of an issue because it's pretty similar. Uh, so the first of our, our six options, the first you can 
do an IRA rollover. Uh, second, you could leave it at the company in the company plan. Now, let's say you are moving to a new job, and at this new position, you're going to open up another qualified plan or company plan or another 401k. Well, one option is you could choose to roll it from the previous employer 401k to roll it into the new company plan. So you can put in money from other 401ks, you could roll it into the new company's plan. If you happen to really like that plan, uh, you like the options or the investment options inside of that 401k, you could roll that old 401k into the new 401k at your new employer. And again, this would make sense, especially if you consider uh, working past age 70 and a half, because if you continue to work uh, at that company, you don't have to take any RMDs, required minimum distributions, from that company plan. Uh, the fifth, uh, fourth option is you could look at doing a lump sum distribution. So you could choose to just take all the money out of that 401k, pay the tax, and then you're free to invest it, spend it, do whatever you want with that money. Now, this might make sense if, if you have some needs for the cash, uh, if, if you need the money. Uh, it might make sense, uh, depending on your situation, also from a tax perspective, especially if you think taxes are going to go up in the future. Uh, but just understand that that is an option, that uh, if you are over 59 and a half, you can take that money out, pay the tax, and then you're free to do whatever you want with it. And if you're younger than 59 and a half, there's certain exceptions uh, that allow you to take that money out penalty free as well, where you would not have to pay that 10% penalty. Uh, but you would still have to pay the tax. So that's something to keep in mind is that you do have to pay the tax when you do that lump sum distribution. Now, the fifth option is you can look at doing what's called a Roth conversion. So this is where you take the money from the 401k and you could convert that to a Roth. Uh, now, the advantage of this is that the after-tax money, so you have to pay the income tax, but now that after-tax money can grow tax-free inside of a Roth uh, IRA. Uh, and this makes sense, especially if you think taxes are going to go up in the future, which a lot of experts uh, think they will. Uh, and that's even the way the law currently is written, is in 2025, marginal tax rates are going to go up, whether we like it or not, uh, let alone whatever happens in 2020. So that fifth option is you could look at doing a Roth conversion. And then the sixth option is along the same lines, you could look at doing what's called an in-plan Roth conversion. So let's say uh, you terminate service at your current employer, uh, you, you work at a new company, and that new company offers a Roth option. Uh, well, you might be able to do a Roth conversion uh, at that company, uh, where now if that company does offer a Roth 401k option, uh, you could pay the tax and move the money into the Roth 401k at that company uh, plan. So uh, that gives you six options with regards to uh, kind of considering a rollover. So there's more than just a rollover. You can look at doing a IRA rollover. You could choose to leave it at a company plan. You could roll it into a new company plan. You could do a lump sum distribution uh, or uh, you could do a Roth conversion, uh, converting it to a Roth IRA. Or you could look at doing an in-plan Roth uh, conversion uh, with regards to uh, the money at your uh, previous employer. Now, there's a couple uh, certain factors to consider, uh, and I can't get into too much detail because I want to save time to bring Lynn on uh, to talk about Mind University. But some factors to consider the investment options inside of that 401k versus the IRA, uh, the fees associated with the investments, uh, the expense ratios, looking at creditor protection, again, relying on either federal or state laws. Uh, look at the, the tax implications of the Roth versus the traditional IRA. Uh, there's some estate planning issues to consider. Uh, if you do roll it over, you have more flexibility with regards to your estate planning and looking at trusts as a way to stretch out the IRAs for the next generation. Um, look at uh, life insurance. So sometimes inside of company plans, uh, they allow you to take loans uh, or uh, utilize life insurance inside of those uh, company plans, which uh, inside of IRAs, there's more limitations. Uh, look at the stretch option. Uh, so upon death, stretching out the taxes for the beneficiaries. Uh, inside of an IRA, you're going to have more options and more flexibility versus with a company uh, plan. 
Another thing to take into account is your required minimum distributions. So when you turn 70 and a half, you have to take out these RMDs. You have to start paying some tax on these tax deferred accounts. And if you have 401k money, that's one RMD calculation. And then if you also have IRA money, that's a second RMD calculation. So if you want to aggregate things and make things simpler, uh, maybe you look at uh, just com uh, combining it all inside of an IRA so that you only have one RMD uh, calculation. And then just simplicity, uh, especially as we get older and, and now we might look at organizing things for our, our legacy, leaving things to the next generation. Uh, maybe it doesn't make sense to have 20 different accounts out there. Maybe we should start simplifying and, and paring things down so that our, our personal representatives or successor trustees or our loved ones, uh, it's easier for them to, to wrap up our affairs. So, so there, those are some factors to consider uh, when taking into account looking at doing a, a, a rollover. Uh, and again, you have more than just the option of doing the IRA rollover. You actually have six options. You can do the IRA rollover. You can leave it in the company plan, roll it into a new company plan, a lump sum distribution, Roth conversion, or in-plan Roth conversion. And this is just one of the many topics we talked about uh, uh, with Ed Slots and the other uh, advisors and attorneys and just a wealth of information. And you always have to be uh, constantly uh, sharpening the saw. And if you do want more information on this, I recommend you attend one of our workshops. Uh, we have some workshops coming up in Brighton and Bloomfield Hills in the next couple of weeks. Uh, visit our website at thechrisberryshow.com for more information on those workshops. And then join me. I'm very excited to bring Lynn Brewer uh, onto the show to talk to us about Mind University. If you or a loved one is facing long-term care costs, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the Elder Care Firm. He can help you, like he did Keith Gerard's family. Here's Keith. Basically, it's my in-laws. They're both 90, and uh, they can't live on their own or anything, and they don't have enough money to go in assisted living. We went to Chris Berry to get the VA benefits, and he said, well, we can get almost two grand a month, which they can put towards assisted living. It, it was a big relief. Most lawyers are pretty sharp, but Chris, he knows exactly his business. And uh, it's a shame that these vets have to go through all these processes. But I guess we need people like Chris to help us out. He made it so easy for us. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. The Elder Care Firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Call us today. Get the governmental benefits you deserve. The Elder Care Firm is ready to help you. Visit theeldercarefirm.com today or call 810-214-3800. And welcome back to the show. Very excited to have Lynn Brewer with Mind University. How are you doing, Lynn? I'm doing great, Chris. Yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited to have Lynn on the show. I've known Lynn, how long has it been now? Well, not to age us, but I think it's been nine years. Yeah, so. it's it's been a while. So I'm very excited to have you kind of share your information and, and your journey with all the listeners today. So, so tell me about Mind University. What is it? So Mind University is a cognitive wellness initiative that's a joint program between our agency, Jewish Family Service, and JVS Human Service Agency in Southfield. Um, we really were looking to see what can we do for this area, the metro Detroit area, mm -hmm. in terms of our cognition, mm -hmm. because Michigan is the second state in the country, second only to Florida, for the highest percent of our population being 65 and older. Oh, really? I did, yeah, I didn't know that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, when you mentioned that, that kind of makes sense because I used to uh, volunteer with uh, Area Agency on Aging as part of their uh, Medicaid Medicare assistance program. And I used to do a lot of outreach with Medicare fraud. Mm -hmm. And the leader of Medicare fraud was originally Florida, and then second was Michigan. So I think it's it kind of makes sense. It really does. Yeah. And it also explains why we see new senior housing and assisted livings and memory cares popping up all over the place. Sure. Because as the baby boomers are aging, we'll see that as a society. Yeah. It's interesting, Chris. I don't know if you remember, maybe around 2009, there was the whole trouble with the auto companies. Mm -hmm. And so if you looked at national news, you know, Detroit was 
allegedly hit with an economic tsunami because right. so many people were out of work. And now people like to say that the metro Detroit area and surrounding communities are having a silver tsunami because right. yeah. baby boomers are aging. <laughs> but really, I think what's coming to this area is a cognitive tsunami. Mm. Not in a bad way, not right. to be gloom and doom. Very little of it coming from true cognitive impairment or dementia. Mm. Let me explain to you what I'm thinking sure. about. If we think of that big pie of people 65 and older, mm. only a very narrow slice of them will develop a dementia or Alzheimer's based on their genes, mm. right? That's the piece we can't control. Sure. But the whole rest of the pie will begin to experience normal age-related cognitive changes. Mm. Just like we really expect at some point we'll need reading glasses or our hearing might be less acute, there's very predictable ways in which our brain function does decline a little bit if we're lucky enough to live a long life. Sure, yeah, and, and hopefully we don't put blinders on to the issue like I do with my glasses. Uh, my wife and I, we were at, at a restaurant about a year ago and we couldn't really read the menus and so we both scheduled uh, eye appointments and the doctor said that she needed glasses and I rubbed that in her face uh, and they said, well, you're getting to the point where you may need glasses. So I'm holding off as long as possible, but I, I really understand kind of what you're talking about. So if we're not just talking about Alzheimer's and dementia diagnosis, what are, what are kind of the normal changes to the brain as we age? Well, hold on to your seat because the, the age at which our cognitive abilities peak are age 25. <laughs> so I think peak is in the rearview mirror, maybe for both of us. Sure. But what that means is from birth to 25, every single year our brains can process more and more information in less and less time. And then we reach that top of that bell-shaped curve, we level off and we start a really slow decline. Yeah. But it's so gradual that most of us don't even notice any changes until we hit 40s to 50s. Mm -hmm. Research says 50, okay. but I t give this presentation a lot in the community. I'm here in 40s from people, yeah. and I would have to agree with that myself, too. Yeah. Um, so what we can begin to notice that's normal mm -hmm. would be, first of all, changes to memory. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where it gets confusing because changes to memory can also be a, a concerning issue. But we're talking about changes to memory that are slight. Maybe I'm reading a book and I might have to use a bookmark, whereas in the past I could have known, oh, I, I left off on page 82. Mm -hmm. Or I keep a very detailed calendar in my iPhone. I don't know about you, but I'd be lost without it. <laughs> when I was 25, my my calendar was in my head. Sure. It didn't have to be on paper. Mm -hmm. Or maybe sometimes parking at the mall and coming out and having to think for a minute, now where did I park? We're able to find the car. We're able to get to our appointments. So our memory is different than when we were younger. Mm -hmm. But the important differential is it's not significant enough to interfere with our ability to function. It's more of a nuisance. So that's a normal change to memory. We also have normal changes to our ability to, to focus our attention. Have you mm. noticed that? Sure. I sure have. Yeah. I'm glad I went to college when I was younger. <laughs> but it becomes more challenging to focus our attention. Sure. And people talk to us about noticing that if they're reading a novel or reading the newspaper, they might have to go back and reread because they stop paying attention and they've lost some of the content. Sure. So again, normal, but it's something we want to dust off because attention is really closely tied to memory. We'll mm -hmm. talk more about that sure. in a little bit. Yeah. Um, other normal changes are changes to processing speed. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first learned that, I'm like, how do you know? I don't <laughs> walk around with a stopwatch timing yeah. myself. Time yourself as you're doing <sighs> math questions. But, but let me ask you this, Chris. When you were in your 20s mm -hmm. and something got stuck on the tip of your tongue, mm -hmm. how long did it take you to just get it out? Uh, it would be quick. Yeah, yeah, like a second, right. right? How long does it take now? Now I just try to find a different word. <laughs> I, I give up. <laughs> That's a very pragmatic approach. I hear anything from 15 minutes to four hours sure. to the middle of the night. Oh, that's the name of the author, right? So that's an example of a processing speed slowing down. Sure. Our brain still did the job, right? We, we had a question. We moved from short-term memory to long-term memory, found the right memory, brought it back to short-term and spit it out. Sure. It just took a bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are some changes that are normal and to be expected as we age. The sure. problem is if we don't address them in any way, they can continue very small declines each year. Mm -hmm. And then by the time we're 60s, 70s, 80s, those cumulative changes can be significant. Sure. Now, so given that, and I think we'd all agree that 
kind of as we age, things kind of slow down a little bit in our mind. Are there things that we can do to try to fight back against this? Absolutely. And not only can we do them, it's so important Mm -hmm. to fight back. That's the perfect way to describe it. So first of all, anything we do to fight back against these normal changes has to do with maximizing neuroplasticity. Are Mm -hmm. you familiar with that word? Yeah. I think we've all heard it. Um, I'm not sure everybody knows what it means. Yeah, why don't you define it? This is a little bit of a buzzword, but yeah. Yeah. So I'll give the non-technical definition. It simply means that, that neuroplasticity in our brains means that we have the ability for our brains to learn to adapt, mm-hmm. to change, in some cases do small bits of rewiring mm-hmm. at any age. Sure. We really used to think this only happened birth to age three mm-hmm. because neuroplasticity depends on stem cells being incorporated into new connections in our brain. And we used to think we only produce stem cells birth to age three. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but when my children were very young, which I think was longer ago, <laughs> no, when your children were very young, we were told yeah. to expose them to music and foreign language because right. it was was believe that was the window. Right. Now, yeah, yeah the, uh, the idea that uh, when you're younger, it's a lot easier to learn a, a yes. language than when you're older. Yes. Yeah. And so, in fairness, that's probably the time we're still most prolific mm-hmm. at developing stem cells. But now, we know through PET scans and MRI imagery that we produce stem cells in our brains all the time mm-hmm. throughout our entire lives. It's not a window mm-hmm. that closes. And so, the question is, how can we use those stem cells to help us? Mm-hmm. Because... If the stem cell does not become part of our neural network, one nerve talking to the next nerve, talking to the next nerve, which is how everything happens in our bodies, Mm -hmm. if that doesn't happen, they have really short lifespans and they die. Mm -hmm. doesn't hurt us at all, but we don't gain the benefit from it. Mm -hmm. If we can almost shine a flashlight in our brain to that stem cell to show it where to go, where there's a connection that could use shoring up, Mm -hmm. then that can get incorporated and that stem cell begins to have a longer lifespan. That's the, the layman definition. Sure. Yeah. So then what are things that, is this like doing Sudoku puzzles? What are the things that we can do to really fight back against this, to maintain that neural plasticity? So there's a whole bunch of ways to do that. So I'm going to save your Sudoku question, the mental stimulation piece for the end, because that's a really powerful section. But I do want to touch on the fact that while we can't control our genes and Mm -hmm. they'll express the way they express, there are so many lifestyle factors that we can control that can help us with our cognition. So first one would be socialization. Mm -hmm. You know, with older adults, it is not at all uncommon for people to become more socially isolated. Sure, yeah. That's especially... We see that when maybe a spouse passes away and a lot of questions of should uh, individuals still be living at home or maybe yeah. looking at like independent living or assisted living. A lot of times I joke around that uh, after a long day at work, I wish I lived in an assisted living because I could not clean up after myself, leave my plate at the table and just worry about where I'm going to play euchre or shuffleboard. Kind of reminds me of a college campus. I know. It does sound kind of nice to those of us that are in the field because yeah. we've seen the benefits. <laughs> right. But, yeah. but yes, I mean, you're right. People, spouses pass away. Friends yeah. can pass away. It can children, children can move out of state. Right. And from a brain health perspective, if I'm alone in my home or my apartment, kicking mm-hmm. back, reading, or watching TV, my brain is less active. Have you ever just kind of caught yourself dozing when you're all by yourself? And, oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's what that really <laughs> is. Like, sit down on the couch. I'm out. <laughs> See, there we go. And so that means that our brain really is inactive enough that we can just shut down and mm-hmm. take a nap. So that's... That's an example of what we don't want. Mm-hmm. Not that there's any harm with that happening for a few minutes, a few times a day, but we don't want to be spending days on end like that. Sure. The contrast would be if we're out and about. Now, that can be social plans with friends, mm-hmm. but even if our social sphere has shrunken for all those reasons we just mentioned, sure. if we're out in a mall, if we're down in the lobby of an assisted living at mm-hmm. the gym, our brains have to be vigilant. Mm-hmm. We have to be watching visually because someone could bump into me if I don't move out of the way. We have to be listening and paying attention. Someone might stop and ask me directions or ask me a question. I have to hear what they say and know how to respond. So our brains are much more engaged versus almost put in sleep mode, sure. to borrow a computer example. <laughs> so that's that's one of the reasons that if we increase our socialization opportunities, yeah. it's good not only for emotional health, but for our brain. Yeah, and I think that's something that I see even with my clients as they're moving into retirement. And I kind of see two types of situations. One, where people are retiring from something and they don't really have that thing that's going to keep them energized, motivated, and moving forward and always having something that they're excited to look forward to, whether it's playing with grandchildren or 
volunteering or church, that, that social connection, uh, versus people who aren't just retiring from something, but retiring to something, where they're retiring to uh, being involved with family or, or charities or churches, just being excited and involved in the community. Absolutely. Yeah. And for people who are isolated and are used to a more robust social life, sometimes we can see depression creeping sure. in. Yeah. And, and that needs to be treated, obviously, for someone's well-being, their mm -hmm. mood, but also there's a real brain health component. Untreated depression mm -hmm. can shrink and impair part of the hipp hippocampus functioning, which is part of our brain that's really useful in memory. Mm -hmm. So if people are struggling with depression, it's a great thing to talk about with a physician, with a counselor of some sort, so that they can get that addressed from a brain health perspective perspective as well. Sure. Yeah. So what other factors uh, affect brain health? So stress management. Mm -hmm. I think we all have stress. I have not yet found a way to <laughs> avoid stress from my life, although I wish yeah. that I could. But there's good stress and there's bad stress. Sure. So good stress might be I'm getting ready to go on vacation and I'm cramming to get everything done at work and pack and get sure. to the airport on time. Or someone's having a baby or a wedding. Mm -hmm. That type of stress, while it is stressful to our bodies, because our bodies don't really know the difference between right. good stress and bad stress, is short term. Mm -hmm. The stress that's concerning from a brain health perspective is chronic stress. Mm -hmm. When we didn't realize it, but but a little bit of stress and anxiety has become part of our lives. That long term can have impacts for our brain health. So if people can find some techniques for stress management, whether it's as simple as going out and seeing friends, reading a book, meditating, getting a massage, taking a walk, gardening, there's different things for different people. So people can find things that appeal to them. But if people can look to work in some intentional stress management a few times in the week, if not every day, that's a big step towards brain health. Yeah, my stress management is choking other people unconscious. I do a, a martial art called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu where you kind of roll around on the ground and wrestle. There's no striking or anything, but you do like rear naked chokes and arm bars and that type of thing. Nothing more uh, relaxing after that is uh, trying to be having someone choke you out or, or trying to protect yourself. So, so a well, perfect example of to each his own, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> we all do different things. It might be reading a book to relieve stress. That's or right. Doing some jujitsu to relieve stress. Right? Well, there you go. Sleep is another really important factor mm -hmm. that many of us don't get a really significant quality sleep. Lynn, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> because I know you, Chris. <laughs> but the reality is that we want to spend as much time in deep REM or mm -hmm. rapid eye movement sleep as we can for a couple of reasons. The one most important to brain health is we produce a chemical in our brains all the time. It's called amyloid. And amyloid buildup, an excessive amount of amyloid, is associated with Alzheimer's disease. Mm. It's not a clear link. There mm. are people who will have a lot of amyloid who don't have Alzheimer's and vice versa. Sure. But there's a very strong correlation. Now, we can't help the fact that our bodies produce amyloid all the time. But when we're in the, those deepest levels of rapid eye movement sleep, mm -hmm. we produce the lowest amount of amyloid in any, than any other time in our 24-hour cycle. Mm -hmm. So if we can get that deep sleep and stay in there, there's a very clear, tangible brain benefit. So in order to maximize that, if people can practice good sleep hygiene, going mm -hmm. to bed at similar times each night, trying not to have the TV or other forms of stimulation on right before sure. you go to bed, minimizing daytime nap really can help in that area. Six to eight hours seems to be the recommended amount for adults. And so sometimes older adults will say, I've been up since three in the morning, but if they fell asleep at nine, they got their six hours. So sometimes a yeah. little bit of a gradual moving that bedtime back can be helpful too. Um, medication management is another thing people can take charge of. Sometimes when we get older, our bodies don't um, metabolize drugs as well as when we were younger. And so we need to be very cognizant of that. It's a good question to ask your doctor if any of the medications you're taking might be on the beers list, might mean that they might there might be a better alternative for somebody with advanced age. Mm -hmm. I'm a social worker. I'm not saying to stop any medication, but sure. it's a great thing to talk about with your doctor because some of them are, are more sedating than others and can sure. have impacts on cognition. Okay. Well, well, great. I appreciate you sharing that. And what we're going to do is we're going to continue this conversation with Lynn Brewer from Mind University uh, as we're talking about different factors, lifestyle factors that can impact your brain health. And then we'll get into some uh, options to try to fight back against the deterioration. So stick with us after the break. 
The cost of care for an elderly loved one or a loved one with a chronic illness is shockingly expensive. If you are dealing with the unbelievable cost of care, make sure you get all the benefits you're entitled to. Here's certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the elder care firm in Brighton. Most of my clients are are really concerned about long-term care costs. They don't know where to turn. And what we can do is put together legal strategies to protect your resources and also bring in additional resources to help pay that cost of care. One of the things that they often say is that I, I wish I knew about this years prior. And unfortunately, the information is out there, but there's just so few certified elder law attorneys. As the only certified elder law attorney in Livingston County, it's my job to make sure that our seniors, our loved ones, our veterans have the best quality of care possible and the best quality of life possible. Protect your hard-earned assets from probate, long-term care costs, and the IRS. The elder care firm will get you the government mental benefits you deserve, including veterans benefits and Medicaid. Visit theeldercarefirm.com and schedule a free 15-minute phone consultation. That's theeldercarefirm.com. And we're back with Lynn Brewer from Mind University, and we're talking about the different lifestyle factors that we can control that impact our brain's health. So what do we have next in terms of lifestyle factors? Lynn? Everybody's favorite, exercise. All right. Although, Chris, I think it is your favorite. <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, I did some jiu-jitsu this morning, so I got my exercise in. There you go. So anything that's good for our hearts is good for our brains because when we have cardiovascular issues, mm-hmm. that can lead to a vascular dementia. So it really can impair our cognition if we're not getting a steady flow of oxygen to the brain. Sure. So general recommendations are anywhere from 150 to 180 minutes of exercise a week. Doesn't seem to matter how you break it down. Mm -hmm. Although for those of us that would say 45 and over, there's a newer recommendation Mm -hmm. that is saying it's better to do 45 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. So that might, yeah, might change things a little bit for people to think about. It's just some newer research. Um, Aerobic component is really important. The strength training is good for our bones, but from a brain perspective, we want to be sure we're getting aerobic exercise in. Uh, Nutrition is also another thing that we can look at that's within our power to control, wanting to be sure that our diet is following something like a Mediterranean diet, where it's largely a plant-based diet. There are lean proteins involved, but only a few servings a week. It's largely fresh fruits and vegetables, heart-healthy whole grains, um, and then a little bit of fruits, a little bit of healthy oils, and of course, a little bit of sweets, but very I'm little bit. i caring about the bacon and the ribs <laughs> and all the things that I like. Yes, I know that's <laughs> challenging. It's challenging. But if we increase, if people want to take smaller steps, they can increase the amount of antioxidants they're getting in their diet, which help with removing free radicals. You might have heard that term on a commercial. It's essentially like brain dust. Every time we breathe, Mm -hmm. the good news is we send oxygen to our brains. Bad news is a little bit of oxidation happens that can get some dust up there called free radicals. So antioxidants can help eliminate that. Mm -hmm. Find that in some of your favorites, I'm sure, red wine. Mm -hmm. My favorite, dark chocolate, um, as well as dark leafy greens and some nuts. Also great to incorporate omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, which we can get from fishes and from heart-healthy oils. That really helps strengthen cell membranes and neurotransmitters, so very helpful for brain health. So I think the one thing that everyone will take away from this is that they can eat chocolate and red wine as much as they want, according to Lynn Brewer. It's my tagline. (laughs) Absolutely. And uh, spirituality is one other topic to touch on quickly. I think for many people, spirituality is tied to their religious identity. And for just as many people, it's not. They're completely separate. From a perspective of brain health, it doesn't matter. When we talk about spirituality, we simply mean finding a way to connect with something larger than yourself Mm -hmm. to calm and quiet your mind. I don't know if you've turned in, but minds are busy places. (laughs) I know mine is anyway. They can always be running. And we want to just calm calm that down. And so meditation, Mm -hmm. even connecting with nature can be all components of spirituality from a brain health perspective. Okay, good. So now that we know some of these factors, uh, I guess... um, I think we were going to talk about mental stimulation as well. Yes. We talked about that a little bit, kind of the Sudoku. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So what the research is showing over the last several years is that of all the lifestyle factors, and they're all important to attend to, mm-hmm. mental stimulation seems to be the most powerful, especially if it's a standalone. So if somebody out there can do all of these things, mm-hmm. fantastic, go do it. Mm-hmm. But if people realistically feel like, I can't commit to all that, that's overwhelming. 
morning. They can't commit to the red wine and the chocolate? Well, the chocolate, yes. <laughs> um, then, then mental stimulation is really something to think about. And there's okay. so many different studies that we can reference. But essentially, that neuroplasticity we talked about mm-hmm. In order to incorporate those stem cells, in order to make very small new neural connections, Mm because let me be clear about one thing, we can't repair damage that's already happened. Mm -hmm. So if there's a damaged nerve area in our brain, that's just the way it's going to be. It's almost like when the freeway is closed, we take the side streets. So if a main neural pathway is damaged, we can make small, smaller connections between nerves that can help the equivalent of a side street. So in order to do that, it takes systematic challenge that's gradually getting more difficult and faster to certain domains of the brain for a certain amount of time each time and for a certain amount of weeks. There's really specific guidelines that have come out of literature, and some of the studies include one done by the National Institute of Health. So really interesting. The the short version is things like Sudoku, crossword puzzles, culture, going to concerts, art museums, all those things have brain health benefits. But there's more benefit if we do something we have never done before. So if I do crossword puzzles and always have and love them, I have a well-worn neural connection in my brain. I have like the equivalent of 275 for right, freeways right, sure. for how to do a crossword puzzle. Yeah. So it's better to do that than to sit idle, but I'm not going to make any small new neural connections. But I don't golf. I would stand there with a club in my hand and not know what to do. So if I wanted to work on my brain, I should pick up a golf club and try and figure out how to look at the ball, look at where it has to go, and use my body to get it there. And I don't mean scoop up the ball and throw <laughs> it, which I would probably try. So novel yeah. activities completely different from what's been done before. Uh, last month I was trying to get into juggling, which was frustrating because mm. I've never juggled before. Uh, I can do two in the air, but adding the third one uh, kind of confuses me. So I was watching some YouTube videos yeah. on how to pick up juggling. Uh, kind of gave it up, but now that makes me want to pick it back up and, and really start learning something new. Absolutely. It's a great thing to do. And I'm sure everybody can relate to something they've tried for the first time that they were really bad at. I mean, we tend to do <laughs> the things we're good at, right? <laughs> but with practice, we get better. That's neuroplasticity. Why else would we get better? But right. our brain starts to wire a road to know how to do that task. Sure. So um, there's a re- the- Behind Mind University is a program from the New England Cognitive Center. They have been on the front lines of cognitive training and brain health for over a decade, and they've created a suite of programs called Mind Aerobics. And the Mind Aerobics classes follow all the evidence-based protocols, meaning people are pre-tested, post-tested after they complete the class, and you can see improvement in many people. There's no program out there where every single person improves, so I don't want to give that impression, but this program got first the research-based designation and then evidence-based designation because the body of research shows there's enough improvement in people in each class to make that claim. So that's really significant if we're going to invest our time and our money in some sort of training program. In this particular class, people meet twice a week. So this is Mind University. This is Mind University. It's the Mind Robust classes through the New England Cognitive Center. People meet twice a week for an hour for 12 weeks. So I want to address that. When I first heard of twice a week for an hour for 12 weeks, when am I going to (laughs) find the time? I think that's naturally how we think. But, you know, when they explained to us and, and they showed me some of the research, It's like if we are sick, we have strep throat, we go to the doctor, we get an antibiotic. He says, Chris, you need biaxin, 500 milligrams, twice a day for 10 days, you'll be great. So you start taking it. So the 500 milligrams is the right dose. Mm -hmm. So that's the equivalent of an hour at a time. Okay. Okay? And the 10 days is how long it takes to get a lasting benefit. Mm -hmm. What happens around day three? Start feeling a little bit better? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens if you stop taking it at day three? That wouldn't be a good idea. It comes right back. Right. So that's why it takes 12 weeks. If we're talking about people investing in some curriculum that will give them a lasting benefit, Mm -hmm. we're just not helping ourselves if we can't sustain it at least for an hour at a time, Mm -hmm. at least two times a week, and at least for 12 weeks. Like going to physical therapy. I got a hip. I need to go a couple times a week for a couple months, and I'm good. I know how that goes. Oh, I bet you do. (laughs) 
So the interesting part about this is the classes are designed to follow all the research, which shows there are six domains of the brain that have to be targeted in a specific order to get maximum benefit in terms of neuroplasticity. So classes start with a reaction time activity. Reaction time is something we don't ever think about. It's an automatic process. So as you were driving to work this morning, if you came to a traffic light that turned yellow, reaction time means how quickly did your eye send a signal to your brain to send a signal to your foot to come off the gas and press the brake. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, I think, Detroit Science Center Hands-On Museum. There's a, a game they would play, and I did it with my kids, where like a ruler would drop, and it would be like, how long before your reaction kicked in to grab that ruler? Right. Kids were like... Quick, right. Like, no. right. <laughs> and and we just continue to slow. And we've all right. seen older adults in our families and in our lives, they slow in other areas sure. as well. Yeah. So we've got to dust off reaction time, especially if we want to keep driving. Um, then the next activity is one of visual spatial skills. Mm-hmm. Older adults, and I hate to include myself in that category, (laughs) but sometimes we just get a little more bruised and banged up than we used to. I don't know if you've heard that or noticed that because our visual field shrinks as we get older. So if I hold my hands out to my side, too bad this isn't television, (laughs) you know, I used to be able to go way far back, wiggle my fingers, and I can see that looking straight ahead in my peripheral vision. But as I've gotten older, I have to come in a little bit more to see it. That's a shrinkage in our visual field. It continues as we get older. Yeah, I remember... uh, played a ton of basketball. I remember there was a basketball uh, VHS I was watching with uh, Dr. J, and one of the exercises was taking a basketball in each hand and trying to throw it up and catch it in each hand as far out to the side as possible to improve that visual right. skills. Right, yeah. right. And so what happens in real life for us is we walk through the door and we don't clear the door jam and we end up with the bruise, <laughs> or we didn't quite clear the table and it's in sure. our hip. So that's why visual spatial is so important. Also avoiding falls if mm-hmm. there's trip hazards. Yeah. And how about parking? Some Sometimes it's a little humbling to get out and look and say, oh, uh, that was me. Well, I, that, yeah, I that, that's somewhere better. I'm already slipping. My wife makes fun of what a horrible uh, parker See, I am. it's uh, true. She does all the parallel parking. I have to get out and switch with her sometimes. So after dusting off that part of the brain, then we work on attention and concentration. Because attention and concentration is so tied to memory. Mm-hmm. We can't recall later what we really didn't focus on and imprint a memory of in the moment. Sure. And so tuning out distractions and focusing in needs to be strengthened, which we yeah. do in every class. Yeah. Then we move on to memory. Now, in life, I think we talk about two types of memory, short-term and long-term. But from a cognitive training perspective, that's not the memory that we work with. We work with four different types. There's kinesthetic memory, which is as we move through space, can we remember? So if I'm going to visit a friend at the hospital and I get directions at the desk, when I need to leave, can I wind my way back to where I need to go? There's also verbal memory. How well do I remember what I see in word form? So if I'm reading directions or reading instructions. Then there's visual memory. How well do I remember what I see in pictures? And then finally, auditory memory. How well do I remember what I only hear? So what the doctor's telling me, a voicemail message if I didn't have pen and paper. And in life, we use them together. Just like at the gym, you exercise your biceps, your triceps, your deltoids. But in life, you use your arm. But the weaker parts of our memory drag down the stronger parts. So in the class, we train them in isolation. So we discover which one's a little weaker and can get shored up a little bit. Then we move on to language, expressive language. Can I tell people what's wrong, especially if I'm agitated in a crisis, and can I understand all the information coming at me? You know, word-finding difficulties are normal, you know, even when we're middle-aged, but we want to keep it at that level where we just hear a word pop out that wasn't the one we planned, we laugh, (laughs) but we can still be understood, right? And then the final... um, brain task that's challenged in the mind aerobics classes are problem solving skills. I never used to understand, Chris, why so many seniors fall victim to scams. Mm. You know, these are people who in their 30s, 40s, and 50s are so smart, could spot a scam from miles away. How does that happen? And I happened to be able to talk with the executive director of the New England Cognitive Center about that. And she said it's very, very simple. It's a combination of memory. That if we, let's say, I'll give an example from my family. We do support Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation every year. That's a personal cause for us. Let's say I'm in my mid to late 70s and I get an envelope in the mail from the Juvenile Diabetes Research Association, you know, thanking me for my annual pledge, but really gently reminding me that they've not received my check. If my 
visual memory skills are not strong, I might not notice the colors on the envelope and the logo are off. If my verbal memory skills are not sharp, I might not recognize that I support Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. This is from Juvenile Diabetes Research Association. And if my kinesthetic memory of how I move my body in space isn't sharp, I right. might not remember, wait a minute, they can't be looking for a check for me. I do my donations online right. in front of the computer. Instead, I'm going to feel embarrassed, write off a check, and mail it. Yeah. So problem solving gets uh, challenged in every class. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. And so with this program that's outlined through Mind University and Mind Aerobics, if someone wants to get involved with it, is there something local that they can participate in? Absolutely. So we teach classes in many different areas of the Metro Detroit area. Okay. We teach them in Novi. Mm-hmm. We teach them in West Bloomfield, in Bloomfield Township, in Southfield, and in Oak Park. Mm-hmm. But we'll go wherever there's a group of people at the same level okay. who want the class. We've gone as far as Gross Point, so I'm okay. sure Brighton sure. could be arranged sure. if we could find interested people in yeah. a location. So who can enroll in these programs? It's really open to anyone. I, I wouldn't suggest that anybody below 45, the age of 45, try, because they're probably not experiencing enough issues to get benefit yet. So 45 and older, and we see people commonly, I would say, 50 to mid-90s in the class. But people need to be at the same level. Mm-hmm. So the curriculum has four different classes, one for people with normal cognition. It's preventive. It's the way you sure. and I would go to the gym. Right. Then there's a class for people who already have some mild cognitive impairment. Okay a class for people with a moderate dementia, and a class for people with advanced. So in order to find out what's the right level, people have a quick screening assessment, okay. pre-test, and then post-test. Okay. And is there a cost to the program? Yes, there is. Okay. When, when the classes are done locally in our area, it's $20 a session, and there's there's tw- right there's 24 sessions, which yeah. makes it $480. Okay. We have been very lucky to have some grant funding, so okay. we've been able to cut that price close to half, oh, between like $10, $12, $14 a person depending on the location sure. per session. So that makes it more like 240 to 300 a person for the entire 24 sessions. Well, this has been great learning about this. Uh, all these ideas super important. If someone wanted to learn more or, or get a hold of you or Mind University, how can they reach you or how can they learn more? Absolutely. The easiest thing is probably to call our number, which is 248-788-MIND, which is 788-6463. Okay. And that number one more time? 248 248- Seven eight eight six four six three. All right, wonderful. And if you are listening via podcast, uh, we'll have this in the show notes, so it'll be on the website thechrisberryshow.com, where you can get some more information on Mind University, as well as that uh, phone number. And so, Lynn, I want to thank you so much. It's been wonderful uh, having you on. Uh, and uh, again, one more time, what's that phone number? Two four eight seven eight eight. Mind, M I N D. All right, well, thank you so much, Lenora. It's been great. Thank you. Learn more about Chris Berry and how he can help your family by visiting online at thechrisberryshow.com. That's thechrisberryshow.com. You can also call Chris Berry at 810 355 2584. That's 810 355 2584. This program content reflects the opinions of Chris Berry and his guests, not the elder care firm, AE Wealth Management, or the C.J. Berry Group, and is subject to change at any time without notice. Content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment or legal advice or a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security or to follow any legal or tax strategy. There is no guarantee that the strategist's statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses which would reduce returns. All investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There is no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. We recommend that you consult with a professional dedicated to your needs. This program is furnished by the Elder Care Firm. If you or a loved one is facing long-term care costs, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the Elder Care Firm, like Sherry Skelton and her family did from Fenton. My mother has Alzheimer's. My mom just had a regular will. She didn't have anything set up in a trust. And Chris set up a brand new will, and he got everything rolling. Chris has been extremely helpful. My mom would never have gotten my dad's VA benefits if it wasn't for them. 
Lori, who actually did a lot of the paperwork for the VA, she was like my new best friend. I talked to her probably two, three times a week, and we would be on hold together while we were waiting for the VA to pick up. Uh, we were approved, and we would never would have been able to do that if it wasn't for them. I can't even begin to tell you what he did for my family. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. The Elder Care Firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Call us today. Protect your assets from probate, long-term care costs, the IRS, and get the governmental benefits you deserve. Visit theeldercarefirm.com today or call 810-214-3800.